Lawrence Binder is a 1979 graduate of the University of Maine with a degree in civil engineering. And he was also an accomplished dancer. He went on to pursue a remarkable career as a film producer, combining his love of the arts with the essential talent of problem solving grounded in an engineering degree from the University of Maine. He is the producer of films that have won a total of six Academy Awards. His films, which include such noteworthy projects as Inglorious Bastards, Pulp Fiction, and Goodwill Hunting, have been honored with 29 Academy Award nominations, including three for Best Picture. Mr. Bender's film, An in Inconvenient Truth, made with former Vice President Al Gore, raised unprecedented awareness about climate change and won the Academy Award for Best Documentary Feature. Lawrence is also a passionate social and political activist. In 2003, he co-founded the Detroit Project, a campaign advocating vehicles that will end the U.S. dependence on foreign oil. He also traveled to the Middle East with the Israeli Policy Forum, meeting with heads of state. Lawrence is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and the Pacific Council. He received the ACLU's Torch of Liberty Award and was named a wildlife hero by the National Wildlife Federation. In discussing his path to success, Lawrence has commented that his career has combined his love of making movies with a deep desire to make a difference. His strong and passionate involvement in the major issues of our time, including climate change and reducing nuclear proliferation, have enabled him to catalyze a tangible impact of the arts into action-oriented results. It is for this extraordinary record of success in the arts, coupled with his record of commitment to improving all of our quality of life, that the University of Maine bestows the Doctor of Humane Letters on our distinguished alumni, Lawrence Binder. At this time, Trustee Collins will join University of Maine Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs and Provost, Dr. Susan Hunter, in the conferral of the honorary degree, the Doctor of Humane Letters, upon Lawrence Binder. Would they all please come to the stage, please? President Ferguson, it gives me great pleasure to present Mr. Lawrence Bender, upon whom the trustees of the University of Maine system have voted to confer the Doctor of Humane Letters Honorary Degree. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to do something a little different this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, before Dr. Bender shares his very inspiring comments, we'd like to share with you a video that really truly shows the life's work leading to this moment today. So if you would watch the screen, appreciate it very much. Don't you hate that? Hate what? Uncomfortable silences. thing. Ready to come get it? Oh yeah! Everybody be cool. You be cool. Do you love me, Jerry? I adore you, sweetheart. Then tell me it again. Baby, I've already told you three times. Just one more time, please. Don't 
touch it, or I'll stick another one right in your cheek. Pretty cool, huh? Baby, you ain't kidding. I used to be the next president of the United States of America. Our ability to live is what is at stake. Hey, Donnie. Gosh, German here wants to die for country. Oblige him. You're now in the hands of the SS. My hands, to be exact. Nine, 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 nine. Oh, yes, 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 yes. I state with conviction America's commitment to seek a world without nuclear weapons. The optimum number is none. 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 We'd be better off without them. I say zero. No nuclear weapons. Zero. Zero. Zero nuclear weapons. No. 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 Got some balls, Luke. Yeah, amazing, I can even walk. You want to tell me why those men are after you? I can memorize anything. They showed me a very long number. It's a code. Luke Wright, the Big Apple's hardest cop. Once upon a time. Get everybody on this. The Chinese and the Russians. Close every exit out of Manhattan. Let's go to war. Are we safe? For my dying day. Ladies and gentlemen, Lawrence Bender. Wow, you mean. How about them apples? All right. Now, I know you all are graduating, but has anyone seen any of those movies up there? Come on. All right. I know you're all over 17. It's R-rated, but we're all good now. Um, OK. 35 years ago, I was building a concrete canoe in freshman civil and engineering class, racing down the Penobscot River. I guess if you're crazy enough to build and grace concrete canoes in the freezing white water of the Penobscot, you can pretty much leave this place and do anything. I mean, I think that's what they were thinking when they told us this. But no, this is not true. In fact, let me stipulate right here and now that rowing down a freezing river in a concrete canoe does not guarantee any kind of success whatsoever, unless you call surviving hypothermia success. When I got the invite, I was having dinner with Warren Beatty and Annette Benning. Okay, I just want to drop their names. I wasn't really. I don't really know them. I wasn't really having dinner with them. Actually, I was having dinner with them. And Annette just beamed. Uh, she recalled when she had given a commencement speech and, and the warmth that she felt in reconnecting with herself. Then I spoke to my mom and my dad. My mom's here, by the way. Yay! <laughs> and they said, what a great honor it would be for me to receive this. But all I could do is relate to Larry David on Curb Your Enthusiasm and, and think in that very Yiddish way, why me? Why me? <laughs> I think the president is still scratching his head. Because you know, you know the day that I graduated with a degree in civil engineering, I knew I was going to go out into the world and be extremely successful in film? That's kind of obvious. I think he is scratching his head. <laughs> well, contrary to um, popular belief, we in Hollywood do have the ability to soul search, which is what I did after watching an entire episode of House of Cards in one night and after trying to emulate Kevin Spacey, I came up with a very simple and very important reflection. I would not have this life if not for this university. So I want to give you a small understanding of how and why that is in hopes that it may in some way be useful to you in your finding your paths. I was the type of kid who really had no idea what he wanted to do growing up. I was good in math and science. My grandfather was a civil engineer, and I knew there were jobs in this area, so I decided to come to school and study engineering here. And I truly loved studying engineering. I truly did. But something inside me could not envision what it was that I wanted to do spending the rest of my life. 
and I tried to figure out that, what that journey was. And it prompted the self-discovery, which I did here, and I continue to this day. At UMaine, I was able to explore and discover a myriad of potential ideas. I was able to imagine and then reimagine my life every couple of months. I started, I started taking pottery and I was going to open a pottery store. I was taking karate, I was going to open up a dojo. I almost left and, and went to culinary school. And I was lucky to have parents who supported me in this constant search. Uh, very worried, uh, but supportive. And I was lucky to have a university that allowed for this search to occur. Looking back, it really was amazing. Then one day I was out with this girl I was dancing with. I was dating this girl from Blue Hill. Anyone here from Blue Hill? I mean, I was dating this girl from Blue Hill. And, uh, and we were dancing, she says, you know we need guys in our dance department. Would you come check it out? And I said, sure, why not? So I went and I took my first dance class in my karate gi. Didn't look so good. That same day, I saw a photograph of this beautiful black man dancing through the air, leaping on the, on the wall of the, um, of the dance department. He was traveling the country, going to schools, and teaching and inspiring people to dance. His name was Arthur Hall. I took a class, and that was it. I found my passion. For the first time in my life, I knew what it was that I really wanted to do, which was to be a dancer. And for the first time, I knew what it was to be connected to myself. It was like the first time you fall in love. There's nothing like it. So fast forwarding, I joined the dance class. I joined the dance department. I joined the Ralph Robinson Ballet Company here in Maine. I graduated with a degree in civil engineering and moved to New York City to be a dancer. <laughs> People sometimes ask how I became a producer as I became a dancer. Well, after years of trying and being around some of the greatest dancers in the world in New York, passionate, poor, and too many injuries later, I had to stop. It was devastating. I thought my life was over. But a short time lady, uh, later, a buddy of mine said, you should try this, this acting class. And I found myself in this amazing class and with something else that I truly loved. And there I was with Mickey Rourke, Jessica Lange, Marla Thomas, Christopher Reeves, all these amazing people very early on in the career. Well, it turns out I was basically the only guy in my acting class that did not go on to become a star. <laughs> Why am I here? So I moved to LA to act. I bought a car for $400. I called it my BGT. That's the initials, the famous initials for my big green thing. Uh, big enough to sleep on, which I didn't end up having to do. I worked for free on movies. I ate on the set. I slept on people's couches, but all was good. And then one day I looked around and I saw what I wanted to do, which was to produce movies. And it turned out I had all the training I needed. You see, I go all the way back to this school. Now in life, I feel like there are varying degrees of two types of people. There are the engineers, the practical people that help make the world go round. And then there are the creative ones, the artistic people. And here, I got training in both those areas. I got to flex both of those muscles. And that's, that's what I needed to produce. And that reel of movies you just saw up there, that's a reflection of all that. So now it comes time to say what I, to talk to say what I'd like to say to you. I was doing a gala a few months ago honoring Al Gore for the Institute of the Environment at UCLA. As you saw, I think some of you saw, some of you were underneath that, hopefully you were able to see the movies, um, that I produced an inconvenient truth with Al Gore about the climate crisis. Now this is probably one of the most important issues facing us in our lifetime. And even yesterday in the front page of the New York Times, it said for the first time, uh, we've hit 400 parts per million in, in the atmosphere, the first time in three million years. It's terrible. So I was having dinner with Jeffrey Sachs a few weeks ago, uh, an economist who wrote The End of Poverty, among many other books. He's a key advisor to the United Nations um, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. The United Nations sees climate change as the number one driving issue wreaking havoc on the world today in the coming decades. Extreme weather, floods, hurricanes, fires, droughts, on and on and on, desertification, all going to dramatically affect us. Well, at this dinner, Al Gore gave an incredible speech about this battle 
to fight the climate change. And as he addresses, he recalled JFK's famous speech announcing the ambitious goal of sending a man to the moon within a decade. When just eight years later, Neil Armstrong stepped off the lunar module's ladder onto the moon, the average age of the people in mission control is 26. That means those kids were only 18 when they were inspired by JFK's speech. It was only eight years from the time JFK put down that marker. JFK said, we choose to go to the moon and do other things, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. And I say to you, there are so many tough challenges in this world. Put down your marker and, and fight those challenges, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. I remember being with Harvey Keitel when we were introducing Reservoir Dogs at the American Film Institute's graduating class of uh, directors. And he asked them a very simple question. Are you here to make good movies? And this very Harvey Keitel way, are you here to make good movies or bad movies? Or great movies? I say to you the same question. Are you, are you here to make a good movie or a great movie in your life? Well, how can you achieve greatness? I think there's three basic ingredients. One, you must find your passion. Two, failure must be a possibility. And three, never give up, especially when you feel like you're failing. Well, if I was able to find my passion, you certainly can. I'm certainly a type of person who had no idea what he wanted to do and was able to figure it out. Certainly had lots of failures, as, just, as I said just now. The ability to allow yourself to fail is the ability to allow yourself to go full on and break boundaries. Many times it's only by failing that you find the real truth. And this is not esoteric. This is basic to the heart of all entrepreneurism. It's funny because in this country we're taught never to fail. But scientists all know that it's only through a series of failures that you succeed. The great warriors are great not because they don't have fear, but because they have the courage to face their fear head on and continue on. And finally, you must not stop. Now, intelligence is studied a lot. IQ, grade point average, all the tests you've taken, all the hard work you've done. But it turns out that although intelligence is extremely useful, there is another factor that really determines success. It's called grit. Good old fashioned elbow grease, the ability to work hard consistently persist, not give up, and stay the course. That is the main predictor of success. I'd like to end on one last important note. In making the documentary about, glow, um, about nuclear weapons, Countdown to Zero, I was reading Dr. Robert Oppenheimer, and he said this quote, there are children playing in the streets who could solve some of my top problems in physics because they have modes of sensory perception that I lost long ago. It is this child within us, your unique way of seeing the world, that is your gift that you must never lose going forward. When I screened Goodwill Hunting at Camp David, in Camp David, uh, 1998, and I met the president, President Clinton and Mrs. Clinton for the first time, I had one of those light bulb moments. The thing that was missing in my life was something that they were doing, which was making a difference. And I began a journey to find my way to make a difference and build that into my life. It was only then that I really started to feel whole. And it culminated when I made this movie with Al Gore and the KB in Truth. And I got to see firsthand how a movie can educate and inspire, inspire a movement. It was really thrilling. In my little boy's kindergarten class, the rabbi says the school's main purpose is to grow menches. That's Yiddish for growing good kids. That's the best I could hope for my son, and the best I can hope for you, no matter where your past leads you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, and good luck.